It's nine o'clock. Do you know where your children are? Good evening. I'm Hugh Downs. And I'm Barbara Walters, reporting tonight from Los Angeles. And this is 2020. From ABC News, around the world and into your home, the stories that touch your life. With Hugh Downs and Barbara Walters, this is 2020. Tonight, he was the other victim. The young man brutally murdered with Nicole Simpson. Now, his family wants you to know the real Ron Goldman. I'm very glad that I was able to be here uh, and spend this time with you because God knows where I'll be in a year. For the first time since his death, they share their feelings about the headlines. He had the name, he had the family, he had a life. He, had, he was more than a male companion. About the rumors. Did Ron ever mention Nicole Simpson? And about the man charged with his murder. A Barbara Walters exclusive. A family's emotional tribute to their son and brother. Who was Ron Goldman? And... Guilty! The truth about TV talk shows. Don't believe everything you hear. There's so much pressure to get a guest that fits the slot that you need filled. Some guests are asked to exaggerate. Others tell outright lies. If I raped over 90, 90 prostitutes at gunpoint and knife point. Are these guys who they say they are? Is this couple on the level? Catherine Cryer with an eye-opening report. It will change your view of talk shows. Who are these people? What? You'll be surprised at what goes on among air traffic controllers. Sitting there working very heavy traffic, and all of a sudden I feel a hand. Sexual harassment. So outrageous that the government tried an experiment. Men and women changed roles. And guess what happened? I was harassed inappropriately touched the wrong place. Did the sensitivity sessions go too far? Don't use abuse to fix abuse. Bob Brown with a provocative story about the way men and women react. When the tables are turned, those stories, plus the latest from Haiti, tonight, September 16, 1994, after this brief message. How do you explain the inordinate national fascination with the O.J. Simpson story? Over the past three months, we've been riveted by every detail of his life and that of Nicole Simpson, whom he's accused of murdering. But as you know, there was another victim that night. His name was Ronald Goldman. And despite all the headlines, we don't know really very much more about him than that. Tonight, we will. Barbara reports now from Los Angeles. Well, Hugh, tonight, Ron Goldman's family breaks a long silence. We have read that Ron Goldman was Nicole Simpson's male companion. We have read that he was her lover. There have been all sorts of rumors about him. But now, for the first time since that horrifying night, the Goldman family set the record straight. Here is Ron's story. This is L.A. All I want to do is have some fun. He was a Los Angeles free spirit, 25, single, and finding his way in the big city. He was good-looking and did an occasional modeling job. But Ron Goldman mainly supported himself by waiting on tables at restaurants in his Brentwood neighborhood. When he wasn't working, he would gather with friends at places like Starbucks Coffee Bar on San Vicente Boulevard. One of those friends was Nicole Simpson, and their relationship has been the subject of rumor and conjecture ever since their deaths. Nicole would let Ron borrow her stunning white Ferrari. Friends say he got a real charge out of tooling it around. Ron was working at the Mezzaluna restaurant the night of June 12th when Nicole Simpson, their mother, and other family members came in for dinner. Nicole's mother left her eyeglasses on the table, and Ron Goldman volunteered to take them to Nicole's home a short walk away. That's where he met his death. His body and that of Nicole Simpson, both brutally slashed, were found in front of her townhouse shortly after midnight. On the ground near the bodies were Ron's beeper, a bloody glove, a knit cap, and an envelope containing the eyeglasses he had come to deliver. Ron Goldman is buried close to his family's home in a Los Angeles suburb. 
The family, still coming to terms with their grief after three months, has stayed out of the public eye. But where others have engaged in speculation about the way Ron Goldman led his life, they have knowledge. They agreed to share it with us in a conversation that will stay with me for a long time. Mr. Goldman, you and your family have kept a very low profile. Why have you and, and your family decided to do an interview now? I think it's probably because so much time has gone by that um, we as a family have sort of begun to feel that uh, Ron's a bit forgotten, that uh, we'd like people to know who the real Ron was and uh, where he came from. Ron was the first child of Fred Goldman's first marriage. His younger sister is Kim. Fred Goldman got sole custody of both children when they were very young, so the three of them were extremely close. How much older was Ron than you? Uh, three years. Three years. What kind of a brother was he? My brother um, was very protective of me, and he looked out for me, and he always took care of me and babysat for me, and... He was like a second father to me. Did you and Ron stay in touch with your mother? No. No. Um, my mother, it was my mother's choice to not keep in touch with Ron and I. Um, we had tempted to reach her and to have contact with her, and she didn't respond. Eight years ago, Fred Goldman married Patty, who had three children of her own. Brian, the eldest, is away at school. Michael is 16 and Lauren 14. They all consider the family merger a success. Everybody got along great. It was unbelievable. Because... Was... Go ahead. Well, it was kind of neat because um, everybody took on different roles. You both wanted to be part of this interview. I know that. To, to say, to let people know what your, what your stepbrother, what your brother was like. It's important to you, isn't it? Yeah. Why? Because he was just like another brother to me. He was always there whenever I needed to talk to anyone. And every any time there was a problem, I went to him probably first because he understood all my problems because he went through them all too. You had a big celebration this year when you became 13. Your, your bat mitzvah. Yeah. And uh, we have a very happy, smiling picture of Ron at that. Yeah, uh, tell me what it was like. It was a lot of fun. We danced like all night. He danced with you? Yeah. Yeah? Um, he got up there and danced, and he was real, like, outgoing and getting up there and having a good time. He had a really good time that night. He had a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Fred, Brian, which is my brother, and Ron and I were all up on the stage dancing all four of us together to this, I forgot the song. Old Time Rock. Yeah, Old Time Rock. Yeah. Okay, obviously this is your older brother. Um, we don't get to spend very much time together, so I'm very glad that I was able to be here. Uh, and spend this time with you because God knows where I'll be in a year. Ron never drank, uh, never took drugs. He didn't. He just always said, I know better than that. Like, his Kim was the same way. Overnight, he was suddenly bigger and <laughs> taller than I was. Um, I can remember years ago, uh, I would always say, Ron, you're smaller than I am, so watch out. But uh, suddenly one day, it wasn't the case. He was bigger. He died so young, 25. Was he still searching, or do you think at that point he'd begun to find the focus? I, I think he found the focus. Yeah, he, he was focusing. He, it was a little secret between Ron and I, which my dad hates. <laughs> but um, my brother had down. people. <laughs> he had people that were looking into, you know, wanting to help him open up in a restaurant, and he had done checked out local spots. He wanted it to be like a little neighborhood spot. And I kept saying, well, why don't you tell dad about it? And he says, because I want to put it all together so I can present it to him because I want him to be a part of it. Was he getting backing? Yeah, he was. We hear again and again um, that people liked him, that he was very outgoing, that people naturally took to him. What was there about him? My brother is such a caring, person. He had a very genuine soul about him. And he, partly I think because he had that role with me to be the protector, you know, and then he, and he carried that out with the people that he came in contact with. What did you learn about Ron the last two months 
that you hadn't known before. <sighs> um, a lot that I missed, in part because um, I was unaware of how many people Ron knew and had touched at Ron's funeral. When we walked out of the chapel and looked across the road to the gravesite on a hill, it was loaded with people. We were told later that there were somewhere in the neighborhood of four to 500 people, people that Ron knew. So I was really unaware of, of all of that and, and learned that part. It was really quite remarkable. I, I guess the thing I learned the most was that um, Ron had, had really pulled his life together. And uh, I didn't know to what extent. You'd been a little concerned before? Yeah. And now you know that he really had a serious plan. Yeah, it's wonderful to know. A little late. Ron, we heard, had done work with cerebral palsy, uh, people who are afflicted with cerebral palsy. Did you know that? Yeah, he used to work there, I think, about eight hours a day. He used to help them get dressed, help them bathe them, you know, get bathed and feed them. And we had heard from some of the people at, uh, at cerebral palsy. It was a, it's a um, residential home that uh, Ron used to turn up the music in the rec room real loud. And, take the people in the wheelchairs and dance around with them. You know, we have read about Ron being in the fast lane, you know, driving Nicole's white Ferrari. Uh, what, what does that mean, the fast lane? What was his life as much as you know it? Well, I don't know. I, I guess that some people could he hear the term fast lane, and it, I, I guess it could bring about some negative images. Um, but knowing Ron, I mean, he liked the dance. He liked to be around people. I don't, I never, ever got the impression that, you know, that Ron saw himself as quote unquote in some sort of fast lane. Yeah. Um, or a ladies person. man. But, um, I he don't. He dated a lot. He dated a lot. My, but brother, I don't... my brother wanted to be married and he wanted to have a family. Did he have a girlfriend? Um, he was dating a young lady. When he had a girlfriend, you met the girlfriend? He wanted to get the seal of approval from the family. <laughs> ah, this is a lot of family to get an approval from. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, so we always knew who, when Ron was dating somebody. Did Ron ever mention Nicole Simpson? Never. Never. Did never. you ever know never. that she existed? Mm -mm. No. So I'd never heard of her. Would you have if she were a part of his life? If, if. Oh. Yeah, yes, if, you all feel that. Absolutely. Yeah. I definitely, if Rana was, I'm sorry, go ahead. I definitely think Frederick, Frederick Kim definitely would have known because I know the relationship um, Ron and Kim had and anyone Ron was dating had to go by Kim first. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so many rumors. First there were rumors that Ron and Nicole were lovers, then there were rumors that he was gay. Did you hear those two? No too? way. Anything, <laughs> anyone from, but Ron. I'm sure you've heard that it's a lot of Things that have to. Yeah, we've have heard to be some of them, story. unfortunately. There were even at one point rumors that he wore a beeper, and so that might have meant something about drugs God, and no. being targeting. He wore a beeper because he had a he I was a tennis instructor, and he was running his own um, mm -hmm. uh, lessons. So people beeped him if they needed to get a hold of him right. that way. As we have seen in other cases, often the victim is put on trial, and there is an unrecognizable figure to the family. Are you prepared for that, that that might happen? I think that um, I, I almost expect anything to occur. And it's part of the reason I think that we're here, is that mm -hmm. um, we haven't said anything about who Ron was as, as our son and brother who who he was as our family and um there's been so as you've indicated there's been so many rumors and bits and pieces that he that 
he, he's still not quite a real person. I keep hearing that he's this aspiring actor model, and mm -hmm. and that that's not who Ron was. And when I hear people say aspiring actor and model, that makes him out to be flighty, and that's not how I know him. And he that's wasn't not how we know him. He wasn't not just a good-looking hunk. No, he no. had brains, and he had smarts, and he... Feeling. Yeah. How did you hear about his death? Oh. The coroner's office called. And I couldn't even, when they said this is a coroner's office, I knew what coroner meant, but I couldn't register. It just did not register, and this was like at 5.15 Monday. Mm -hmm. And I said, quick, pick up the phone. Something happened. And we both got on the phone, and... The woman on the other end said, I'm sorry to, to bring you this news, but this is a coroner's office. Did you hear about that Nicole Simpson was murdered? Well, I'm sorry to tell you that Ronald, your son, was the other victim. And Fred, Fred's face turned so white. I mean, I started screaming. It was like unbelievable, unbelievable that, I mean, it was such, such a shock. A nightmare. Do you feel that Ron was just in the wrong place at the wrong time? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Ron was doing a good deed um, for Returning someone. Returning the glasses. Yeah. And uh, um, in fact, we had heard someone said, you know, you don't really have to. And Ron said, you know, it's only a block away from my house. I'll go. It's not a problem. I'm going home anyway. And. Um, And he went. It seems almost the entire country was watching that car chase on Friday night. Were you uh, watching? Yes. Uh, <laughs> glued. And we didn't end, want it to end any other way than somebody being caught. We wanted ultimately to have some con some closure. I you, just didn't want any more, more violence. violence. You wanted O.J. Simpson to remain alive so that there could be a close of the case a close to the case eventually know what happened. Right. whether he's innocent or guilty he has a right to you know a fair trial does oj simpson ever acknowledge you in any way no not at all have you ever heard from him at any point no have you heard from his lawyers at any point no no never what are your thoughts about oj simpson when you sit in that courtroom you're innocent until proven guilty do you try not to prejudge? Yes. When you and I had a chance to talk a little bit before this program, you told me that what amazed you was that you got letters from people mm. from all over the country. I mean, oh. most people don't even know your name, one would think. All did over you, the country. Did you bring some of them? to your brought oh, a few. Yeah. Um, a lot of letters? Oh, hundreds. Um, hundreds, yeah. hundreds and hundreds. Um, read, read, read a bit if, of something that you have. To the Goldman family. We, not, we may not be visible. We do not parade with placards. We are not interviewed by the TV. We are here. We feel your pain and suffering and wish to comfort you. You are not alone. That's true. That's some, from some people in California. It must be very comforting. You know, when this first happened and it was Nicole Simpson and a, a male companion, your son, a male companion, a friend, a waiter. I was yelling at the TV, Ron, his name is Ron. You know, because there's nothing that you could do. You know, when you just sit there and you're like, he has a name, he has a family, he had a life. He had, he was more than a male companion. You know, and I, even now I hear, even sometimes lately, it's just yeah, victim, right. not victims. You know, or, I don't know, I, and I, I'm not, I don't take away from Nicole, and I don't take away from her family, but for me, this is my brother. And I scream out his name, you know, and I, every time I, I want everybody to know, you know, that he had a family, and that everybody, I want everybody to know and feel like they, in some way, have met him, or he's touched their lives the way that he touched ours. They know Kim. They know he had a family. The Goldman family is looking for this case to close, Hugh, not just for themselves, but for Nicole Brown's family, with whom they have a 
with whom they have a kinship. You sure can't blame them for, for looking for that. But this trial, you know, most court procedures take a lot of time, but this one seems set at a glacial pace. Uh, well, they're trying. I mean, we, we had met this week with, with this, some of the lawyers. Robert Shapiro said they're trying to do it as quickly as they can. Uh, but Johnny Cochran, um, one of the other uh, very prominent lawyers, told us the jury selection will start on September 26th. It will take at least a month then two to four weeks of pretrial motions. They probably won't start the trial until January. Then the defense won't start until the end of January. It'll be March or April. Yeah, an ongoing reminder to these families, too. Thank you, Barbara. Okay. Next on the program, when you tune in TV talk shows, you hear the most scandalous stories. But are those talk show guests for real? Catherine Cryer with a surprising look at what goes on off camera when we come back. It's another headline that happens every September. Next to the opening of school, the new television season is what grabs most everyone's attention. And this year, you might have noticed an amazing fact. There are now at least 15 talk shows to choose from. The huge success of stars like Oprah and Phil Donahue spawned a whole new generation of talk shows, newcomers forced to do battle for an audience. As Catherine Cryer found out, in their fight for the hottest guest, the most outrageous story, one of the biggest casualties can be the truth. Guilty! The world of TV talk shows. It goes from the serious to the absurd. It gets strange and stranger. Now here's a twist. Half of the clips we've just shown you involve stories that were made up. They're fiction. We'll tell you which ones in a little while, but just how much of what we see on these shows is for real? How important is the truth in these stories? It's secondary. It's secondary to the show. Joy Roller was a producer for several talk shows until the insatiable appetite for sensational fare began to get to her. I was told, Joy, you're not being commercial enough. You're not being exploitative enough. You're not giving us what we want. Finally, she quit in frustration because she says the talk show version of reality too often doesn't reflect the truth. He's so cheap. He opens his wallet. The president start rubbing their eyes because they haven't seen daylight in so long. For instance, the Montel Williams show. The subject, cheapskates and big spenders. Here are a boyfriend and girlfriend. Who bought all the gifts for my family and signed your name on it? Who bought gifts for your family and signed both of our names on it? Me. Did I see a dime? No. Okay? Not a penny. Uh, That's so what you're supposed to do, though. You're my girlfriend. That's our job. Oh, oh wait a minute. Arda Itez and Tommy Carroll say they went on the show with their friends just for laughs. But it was all made up. Tommy and Arda never even dated. Tommy's pal Robert Chinesky went on as a big spender, pretending this woman, whom he now says he met two weeks before the show, was his longtime girlfriend. It was Montel, I enjoy spending money on a woman, okay? And she's a beautiful woman, and I spent money on her. It's just that it got to the point where it was, I was losing too much money. Simple as that. You know, does she want me or does she want the Franklin Mint? My name is not Franklin, okay? All right, it's Vinny. It's Vinny, okay. <laughs> To top it off, Chinesky used the fake name Vinnie Puma. Then there's this couple, Jennifer and Uriel Soto. They went on three different talk shows with three different stories in a matter of weeks. Some of what they said was true. On Jerry Springer, he's a man who says his wife dresses too sexy. If there is any outfit that I have on that is low cut, that is too tight, he will look at me and he'll tell me to take it off. And if I refuse, he'll simply rip it off. On Jenny Jones, the jealous husband. You you actually got into a fight with what five guys? Well, what did, what did they do? Together. What did they do? Uh, Said hi. <laughs> all tidbits of truth, but exaggerated. Jennifer says to play better for the cameras. But the Sotos also out and out lied on Ricky Lake saying they were married cousins. Okay, well, how did you two meet, Jennifer? How did you two meet? We met at a family picnic about. Three, four years ago. And nothing could be further from the truth. And when you showed up at the program, might you look at you and your husband and have any idea that the two of you would be related? No, he's a Mexican and he has black hair and dark eyes and I, I'm the opposite. 
Did so. they ever ask you any questions? Nothing. Nothing. There are a lot of people who will do anything to get on television. They'll even play the role of an imposter. Howard Rosenberg is a Pulitzer Prize winning television critic for the Los Angeles Times. You know, they'll play Joe, the, uh, uh, the incest survivor, on one show and come on another show and play somebody who's addicted to buying or spending or going to shopping malls. What's the difference as long as you get on television? I think we've reached the point now where most of these shows will literally do anything to uh, grab and hold and titillate an audience. The long-standing success of shows like Oprah and Donahue has spawned a new generation of talk shows, all struggling for viewers in a highly competitive marketplace. Many of these newer programs, according to producers we spoke with, fly by the seat of their pants, showing little regard for the truth. Maybe it's a function of budgets, with the more established shows having the tools to avoid the pitfalls. But would some talk shows knowingly put fakes on the air, or do they just put them on with no questions asked? We don't know just how many talk shows involve phony guests, but with little effort, 2020 found plenty of examples, including this one. There are two versions to every story, and that's all I Talk about titillating. It was the story of a gay love triangle told on the Ricky Lake show. This trio says they made up the scenario. They were all just friends, not lovers. And they say the producers never bothered to check out the story. They should have asked me point blank, are you telling the truth? They didn't. Never even They're like, ooh, were, you know, this is too interesting, this is right. juicy, this is really... Like I said, I mean, she was just so excited, the fact that it was a gay story, it was just, <clears throat> that's all it took. There's so much pressure to get a guest that fits the slot that you need filled, that if you just find somebody who will do it, great. Now, you'll check as much as you can with the time that you have, but a lot of times you don't have enough time. And yet you're putting these people on the air and telling the American public, this is real. Right. No, that's very troubling. Doug Tilton and Mitch Ryan say Ricky Lake's producer loved their story, but wanted more so and told them to ham it up. It's just like, you know, play with the audience, but don't, you know, don't do too much and, and don't forget to bring in scandal. And we want to make it look like that Mitch is jealous. And so during the show, they say their friend Chris Thames made it sound as if he was having an affair with Mitch. Have you told this guy to like lay off? No. Yeah, well, no, I mean, I have more of a friendship, but it goes more than that when you're not around. Well, Wait. Oh. See, that's the insinuation that she wanted. The producer gave him that line. In a letter to 2020, a spokesperson for the Ricky Lake show says the staff makes every attempt to verify all of the available facts. But the letter continues. Because the shows often explore emotion, material becomes exceedingly difficult to verify when guests, their friends, and families conspire to lie. The show warns it will take legal action against anyone who uses our program to knowingly lie and misrepresent their story. While some guests lie to the shows, some show producers apparently have no qualms about lying to guests. And this cavalier attitude towards the truth can end up hurting people. They traumatized me in 20 minutes. You know, it took me 13 years to build my world up and they just destroyed it in 20 minutes. And no one said nothing. This woman's sister was about to appear on the Montel Williams show. Then she got an invitation to be a guest, too. Yvonne Porter says the show's producer wouldn't tell her the topic, only to expect a helpful surprise. I told her that I wasn't going to do the show unless I knew what it was. And she said it's about an old boyfriend. She figured there'd be a reunion with a boyfriend she hadn't seen in years. That is, until she heard this. We've been talking about people who feel the need to be provide mercy sex, if you will, to someone else. And I, I want to go back for just a second. But Montel old. said, for those of you just joining us, we're talking about mercy sex. And I was like, mercy sex? And I'm looking like, what? What am I doing here? Who did I have mercy sex with? Then came the bombshell. I had sex with him to get him off of her back. Yvonne's sister said she'd been having sex with Yvonne's boyfriend. They lied. They outright lied. How could, I mean, I asked her, was I going to be embarrassed and humiliated? She said, no, 
what did she call that? I mean, that was serious shock. About the biggest feather you can have in your cap as a host of a daytime television show is to have a guest that you can embarrass live on television. Really sandbag this person uh, to the extent that he or she is unable to extricate uh, himself or herself from the situation and has to sit there and take it in front of the television camera. That's exactly what happened to Yvonne Porter. Yvonne Porter is suing Montel Williams, who turned down our request for an interview. In court papers, Williams denies wrongdoing. An arbitrator is reviewing the case. Montel may have set up Yvonne Porter, but did Jerome Stanfield set up Montel? He says he was down and out, suffering from HIV and psychiatric troubles, and he thought he could make some money. So he called 1-800-MONTEL-2 with a story idea. Stanfield says he told the show's producers he had a drug problem and had obsessive fantasies about rape. But that's not exactly what ended up on the air. In the process, I raped over 90, 90 prostitutes at gunpoint, at knife point. And, um... You did this over a three-year period of time? Yes. About three years? Yes. Since it was scary, powerful, serial exclusive. Rapist, An admitted serial rapist on the loose, home, telling his story for the first time in front of a national audience. Stanfield says he changed his story after talking to the show's producers. So that's the direction that they took me in to say that the rape fantasies was, in fact, not fantasies, but actual rapes you know, of prostitutes. After the show was taped, but before it was broadcast, Jerome Stanfield was detained by the police and interrogated. He told them he'd made up the story because he thought he'd get money. The police released him, saying there was no evidence he was a serial rapist. Did Montel Williams know you weren't telling the truth? Yes. Was there any question in your mind that, that they knew this story was a fabrication? They knew it was a fabrication from the start. You know, With Stanfield's track record, we can't be sure he's telling us the truth. But what is clear is that Montel Williams had his doubts about Stanfield's story before broadcasting the show. Yeah, so what does he do? He runs a little advisor at the beginning of the show saying some questions, quote unquote, have been raised about this man's credibility, raised by the man himself. But we have no information at this time that leads us to believe that he is not telling the truth. And because of that, we feel it is our duty and our responsibility to broadcast this program out of concern for public safety. How can you in any good faith, uh, in any sincerity, continue to do a show like this knowing there's a very strong possibility that the entire show is BS? In a letter to 2020, Mary Duffy, the executive producer of The Montel Williams Show, says the program refutes the claims made by Jerome Stanfield and others cited by 2020. Ms. Duffy also acknowledges that with at least 700 shows to date, it is feasible that a few guests could lie for celebrity gain. The producer says the show stands by its booking and producing ethics and will pursue appropriate legal action against those who lie. So how are viewers to know what's real and what's made up? They can't. So what's to be done? I think it's incumbent on uh, the rest of the media, those of us who consider ourselves to be responsible, to just alert uh, viewers and the consumer public as much as possible to what these shows are doing. And that's all you can do. And then if they continue to want to watch these shows, that's America. Right? Guilty! <laughs> Catherine, there are so many of this type of show that I can understand how under pressure of competition, there would be a great temptation not to delve too deeply into, into facts on that. Well, you talk to the producers and they say, we try the best we can, but many of the shows say we consider ourselves entertainment and it comes with the territory. Yeah. And then mistakes can happen. They happen to everybody, I guess. I. A couple of years ago, I remember, when, you remember the character Buckwheat yep. in the oh, uh, yeah. our gang comedies? We thought we'd found a guy who said he was Buckwheat, and unfortunately, Buckwheat had died a, a while before that. I, I wasn't aware of it, nobody in the studio caught it, and so the next week, I apologized to his family, because it was kind of embarrassing, but that was a mistake. That, but look what you did. You came on the air and made a public apology so that everyone knew what the circumstance was. And unfortunately, we don't see that on these shows. And that, that's a little different from deliberate sloppiness under, under pressures. Yeah.
Thank you, Catherine. If you and I haven't made a mistake in the last minute, we won't have to be apologizing a week from now for what we just said. Well, next, sexual misconduct in the country's largest air traffic control center. Now, this man says he was a target. Did a government plan to promote sexual equality backfire? Bob Brown has the story after this. Sexual harassment by air traffic controllers. It got so bad, the government tried an experiment. A role reversal. Where the men became the sex objects, you won't believe what happens when the tables are turned. When 2020 continues, after this, from our ABC stations. 2020 continues from Los Angeles. Once again, Barbara Walters. It was the notorious tailhook scandal that brought the practice of the sex conflict out in the open. Military women forced to walk between rows of drunken Navy and Marine aviators were groped and fondled as they went. Well, now it seems that that kind of behavior may be more common than you think. Last week, a lawsuit was filed that claimed similar sexual harassment in a most unexpected setting. As Bob Brown found out, it was called sensitivity training, but it may have become as offensive as the behavior it was designed to correct. This is the busiest air traffic control center in the U.S., the Chicago Center. In the late 80s and early 90s, it became one of the focal points of a new training program by the FAA. The program had nothing to do with handling air traffic. It had everything to do with addressing complaints from women and minorities throughout the agency. They said their lives were often made miserable as they tried to break into an area of employment that was traditionally dominated by white males. In 1988, a congressional subcommittee investigated those charges, and one of the women who testified was O'Hare controller Olivette Smith. So I'm sitting here working very heavy traffic, and all of a sudden I feel a hand, not on my thigh, right in my crotch. Uh, in an instant, I had to make an instant decision. Should I address this male? and try to fight him off, or should I continue to work airplanes? I chose to work the airplanes. This particular trainer, he started yelling obscenities, critiquing me using four-letter words. Bitch, uh, that's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Uh, you know, you, you women, you, you don't belong here. And I said something to the supervisor, and the comment that I got back was, he didn't mean any harm. In a strongly worded report, the Congressional Subcommittee recommended that the FAA take action to change that work environment. So the agency hired experts to create three-day sensitivity training workshops. Some women told the experts they couldn't avoid occasional episodes of harassment even when they walked down this aisle on the way to their jobs. Diana Mocha compared the aisle to a gauntlet. I walk through a gauntlet every day, and that's down the road. Comments are made, sometimes it's just looks, but it's a very intimidating situation. One day a woman had on a short skirt, she's very attractive, and these two guys that I work with saw her coming and purposely stretched their cords opposite directions across the two aisles so that when this woman approached, she would have to step over the two cords to pass through our area. And I thought, uh, that's no big deal, they're just being funny. It was because men like Tom Reisel sometimes didn't think twice about things like that that one element of the new FAA workshops involved positioning women along two rows of chairs and having the men walk between them one by one. The idea was to have the men experience what it was like to hear suggestive remarks or receive unwelcome touches. But in a $300,000 lawsuit filed last week, one man claims that exercise and role reversal went much too far. The plaintiff is air traffic controller Douglas Hartman. In a damage suit he filed against the transportation department, he claimed that during one such session in 1992, he was groped around his genitals, called a wimp, humiliated by a chart on which women used drawings of penises to rape the men. He says he had tried to opt out of going through the gauntlet. So I announced to them that I wouldn't take part, and I assume my wishes would be honored, so I would not last. And I walked in the door, and the door was shut behind me, and uh, I was engulfed. There was really no way to move in or out. They uh, grabbed your legs. They um, 
grabbed you both in the front and in the rear below the waist. It was basically a no holds bar type situation. One of Hartman's friends, Ken Kluge, says he went through the same session on the same day and witnessed the incident Hartman complained about. I saw him basically uh, put through the gauntlet against his will. Same touching, same grabbing, same verbal harassment. Well, that was one side of the story. There is another. When Doug Hartman came in and said that he walked in there and he was trapped and he was surrounded and groped and everything else, that did not happen. That did not happen. Richard Spates is one of several other men present at that session who claim Douglas Hartman never passed through a gauntlet. He immediately said, I don't want to participate. Did not even get near the women. And he walked to the left and went over and took a seat. Basically blew the exercise off. And from the start of the class, he tried not to participate in anything. What's going on? Well, many people believe the complaints were part of a preconceived plan to stop not just the gauntlet, which was discontinued after Hartman filed a work complaint two years ago, but the FAA's support of the training workshops, which Hartman characterized as mainly psychological experiments. Many minority employees we spoke with disagreed. They say the overall training worked, that office conditions improved, and that many co-workers and supervisors became more understanding of their discomfort. For three days, they get just a smidgen of what it feels like, and yet we deal with it on a daily basis in the FAA and in the outside world, quiet as it's kept. You know, how can they possibly fix their lips to complain about dealing with a few minutes of, of discomfort or just hearing about my discomfort? But too many elements of the training bordered on the types of insensitivity it was supposed to prevent, even though the FAA's own employees were helping conduct the training. Was it really necessary to display charts using drawings of penises? There was nothing in this room that you couldn't find on the washroom, washroom wall in Chicago Center. Except this was a training session. This wasn't right. a toilet. What we're trying to simulate here is that that stuff is just as offensive. And what about characterizing the Bible as sexist? That, too, was reportedly brought into some sessions and was deeply disturbing to people who heard religions from Catholicism to Islam described as sexist. Um, I think it was referred to in this particular session as just the Bible being sexist or many different religions um, being sexist and how that got played out in our society also. It's very easy to see how people would have been offended by that. Well, and Mr. Brown, we're, we're very much aware that people will come in with these varying degrees of sensitivity to what happens. But the FAA in Washington has heard enough and told 2020 this week it has stopped all training sessions conducted by the company responsible for the workshops. We will not conduct any additional training courses providing by, provided by the company um, whom these allegations revolve around. They spent millions of dollars on this program. If anything comes out of this, I would like to see a more efficient use made of the taxpayer's money. If you're gonna do it, don't try to divide people. Don't humiliate people. Don't use abuse to fix abuse. Bob, how widespread was this in the FAA? Well, uh, this was uh, concentrated in the Chicago Center because they said they wanted to see what kind of uh, impact it would have if a number of people in one place went through it. However, it was, it's a general FAA policy through, throughout the agency. And they say that roughly 20,000 people went through sensitivity training of one kind or another, 3,000 last year. And um, they still stand behind the concept. They say it was under constant review. But it appears that in many instances, it got out of hand and touched on people's most sensitive beliefs yeah, and sensitive right. areas and, and when they were trying to do the opposite. However it went astray, it was set up to correct a very real wrong. I think everybody agrees that there was a problem in the FAA uh, and on both sides. They say that they support uh, sensitivity training, but they support it if it's done right. Interesting. Thank you, Bob. We'll be right back. Now the showdown with Haiti. The White House says preparations for an invasion are going ahead, but one last diplomatic effort will be made to get the military leaders out of Haiti. Late today, it was announced that former President Jimmy Carter would be heading to Haiti, along with former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Colin Powell, and Senator Sam Nunn. ABC correspondent Linda Patillo is in the Haitian capital of Port-au-Prince. Linda, is there any reaction at all at this time from the leadership there on these latest developments? 
you, there has certainly been no public reaction from the three Haiti military leaders that the U.S. says must step down. They are being very quiet, and that is understandable, because one major roadblock to any U.S. effort to get them to leave the country is assuring them that they can leave safely. Even U.S. officials here admit that at the first hint that the generals might be leaving the country, their supporters may target them, feeling that they will be left behind to face the wrath of the Haitian people. Linda, when these three Americans come down, President Carter, General Powell, and Senator Nunn, what do you think will be their chances with the generals? It's difficult to say, Barbara. Certainly everyone here in Haiti is hoping for a solution. Few people want an invasion, although many are convinced that it is the only option left to resolve the crisis in the country. But uh, the generals have put a lot of conditions on their leaving, among them that uh, exiled President Jean-Bertrand Aristide not return to the country. And that, too, could be a big roadblock to any talks. How about the general mood in the city, uh, Linda? I think people are frightened, Hugh. They've been through five days of so-called psychological warfare by the United States. They've had U.S. warships in the harbor, planes flew overhead. Last night, parachutes dropped out of the sky and dropped radios in the city. Uh, people were stocking up on food today, and uh, they're scared, and they believe that an invasion is at hand. Well, certainly one can understand how they would be frightened. Um, thank you, Linda. That's Linda Patillo in Haiti. We want to tell you that Ted Koppel will have more on Nightline tonight after your local news, and we'll be right back. And at the end of our hour here, before we leave, Barbara has a special next Tuesday night. Barbara, tell us about that. Yes, we do. We shared some very intimate moments with three musical superstars, Whitney Houston, Elton John, and country star Garth Brooks, artists for everyone's taste. That's next Tuesday at September 20th at 10 Eastern Time, 9 Central. We hope you'll tune in and have a good time. We'll be watching. And that is 2020 for tonight. We thank you for joining us. And remember, wherever we are, Los Angeles, New York, we're in touch, so you be in touch. I'm Barbara Walters. And I'm Hugh Downs. And for all of us here at 2020, have a good weekend and good night. To inquire about a video cassette of this program, call 1-800-913-3434. The cost is $34.95 plus $3.95 shipping and handling. 2020 is a presentation of ABC News. More Americans get their news from ABC News than from any other source. The American Broadcasting Company. ABC.